Breakers, and welcome to the 43rd episode of Project Studio Tea Break. I am Mike Senior, and I am here with reluctant band magnet John Whit. <laughs> Oh, that's a positive way of looking at it. <laughs> hey there, Mike. It's lovely to be here. And how are you? I, I, I understand you've just been having a little bit of a break. I, I have. I've just come home from Greece. Oh. So in terms of earning a break, I'm not sure, but I have got better at breaks. Oh. I'm approaching this tea break as a practiced master. Oh, that's good. I spent an afternoon in a way that will either be extremely relatable or entirely foreign to you, depending on what <laughs> kind of freelancer you are, or indeed if you're a freelancer. Mm. I spent an afternoon mm. reading a book at a cafe. Blimey. It was absolutely blissful, Mike. I, I, I barely have the words. Mm. What was so special about it was not that I work 24-7 when I'm here. Far from it. Well, I mean, you sleep at least one or two hours, don't you? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to turn the computer on, or apparently, like it can get rusty if you just literally never use it. Yeah, open my inbox, make sure I've still got the password right. <laughs> and you know, I'm as, I'm as distractible as the next person. Yeah, and I will absolutely waste an afternoon on Netflix or, or YouTube or. You know, a wall covered in wet paint, if that's what's on offer. And you agreed to do this podcast in this knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> somehow. Somehow despite it all. But, oh my God, the glory of, like, curated nothing was <laughs> glorious. Oh, what a fabulous way of expressing it. Curated nothing. <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm so glad you do. I don't know about you. Whenever I'm down a YouTube rabbit hole, whenever I'm reorganising the bookshelf, mm. because I don't want to... I don't know, chase a producer or, or write some music or whatever. Yeah. Never fully at rest. I'm distracting myself. It's stolen nothing. Exactly that. And the difference when I've decided there's nothing to do, mm. when I've decided that today I'm going to go read a book I like at a cafe yeah. and drink iced coffees in a climate where iced coffees still make sense. Oh, my God. <laughs> I still remember an age where I would go on holiday with, with my parents. Yeah. And they would want to sit by the pool. Yes. And it was baffling to me because i thought we have chairs at home <laughs> and we have a pond yeah like wh wh what on earth are you doing you could put a chair by the pond and it's the same experience mm. go yeah. swimming go <laughs> do something that's what we're here for i just want to say mum because I, I know you listen i'm sorry i get it now i do <laughs> yes <laughs> nothing appeals more than having a bright sunny day and sunny nature around and deciding just going to sleep for a couple more hours. I'm going to sit here and look at my empty coffee cup <laughs> as long as I can before they force me to order another one. Exactly. And then do the same again. Rinse and repeat. <laughs> it works. Mm -hmm. So while I haven't earned my tea break, I'm here to offer words of wisdom on breaks and relaxation to anyone who might need them. I think the last day I had a day like that was actually my birthday back in May. Oh, yeah. And I made the decision that I was going to get a Disney Plus subscription for a month mm. and sit down and watch superhero films all day. Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. I crumbled at the end and I switched and watched Soul as well. But other than that, <laughs> it was a back to back. I must have got through about four or five of them. That was your only concession to quality for the entire day. Yeah. And I still feel a bit grubby as a result. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you know the, the quality of rest of which I speak. Mm. How about you? It's been kind of getting back to the normal grind. Right. Because I had my holiday like last month. Mm -hmm. And my whole year, to some extent, feels like it's leading up to next year's holiday. Because you kind of plan <laughs> the months out, you've got various things you want to do. Mm. And so you kind of hit the end of the holiday a bit like walking down too many steps <laughs> you get that kind of juddering feeling of like right yeah oh where's all my momentum gone mm -hmm. so this month has been about trying to work out okay what what kind of are my longer term plans now <laughs> what do i want to do over the next mm. six months yeah uh, and building some kind of new plan do you like being kind of knocked out of your inertia and momentum and, and kind of patterns like that does is that a productive experience because you kind of reevaluate or <sighs> not so much i think if i'm going to be brutally frank with myself mm. <laughs> I'm very much a creature of habit. Mm. I am totally the kind of person who gets in the car and finds themselves driving to the kids' school when we're supposed to be going to the airport. Because <laughs> I'm just on autopilot. See, I really like to think that I'm someone who thrives on, on adventure and variety and unpredictability. Mm. But I think what I mean by that, if I'm being brutally honest, 
is going in the morning to the same cafe I go to every morning, <laughs> ordering the same coffee I get every morning, getting, and this is important, exactly the same coffee in my cup, but the cup being a surprising new colour. <laughs> I think that's the level of adventure. And then I can get into the routine for the rest of my day being like, <laughs> what will happen next? <laughs> Gosh. Um, it's the comforting veneer of adventure. <laughs> precisely. It's a surface level polish of insanity on, on what is otherwise a fairly well-structured day. That's what I need. Well, I hate to upset the apple cart, but we actually have real excitement this month. <sighs> and you can't but know what I'm talking about. We have had <laughs> the email to end all emails because... I reached out to Rebecca Angel after last month's episode. <laughs> she actually wrote us an email back, everyone. <laughs> We're going to have incoming Rebecca Angel. Oh, I'm so looking forward to it. I could not be more tickled pink. We write emails to the people we discuss on this podcast. Mm. and um, What's our hit rate been like so far, John? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if they don't know we run the premier Project Studio podcast that either of us do. With a T emphasis, I know. Yeah, we, we, with a T emphasis. <laughs> and a biscuit <laughs> sub-emphasis. So, so it's so exciting to get not just a reply, but one of the loveliest emails oh, I've had yeah. the pleasure of reading in a little while. So what, what was your favourite phrase then? My favourite bit of the email would be me just reading the entire email, which which <laughs> honestly feels, feels a touch inappropriate, uh, <laughs> not to mention slightly monopolising. I am going to pick out one bit though. Go on then. Which is the last paragraph. Okay. <laughs> Please let me know when you would like me to come on the show and answer all your questions about every Rebecca Angel in existence. Because, as probably the matriarch of the Rebecca and the Angels clan, I have that authority. I want to have that level of confidence about anything in my life. <laughs> Any single aspect of what I do or how I live. I mean, if someone rang you up, and we are, we are from the John Witten Appreciation Society podcast, they'd be asking you questions, and you'd be like, well, I mean, I don't want to speak for John Witten. <laughs> Look, when they got in touch, I would just assume that I was behind on my dues or something, or that someone wanted one of my domains, and I would happily give it up. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a cage fighter who goes by John Witten. <laughs> Yeah, no. just knowing that, I'd, I'd say, you know what, fine, yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, awfully sorry, let me just <laughs> clean up these breadcrumbs on my way out. So, okay, okay then, John, what's your, is it Luchador name? Well, this, <laughs> thereby hangs a tail. Because <laughs> um, as, as avid listeners will know, I, I, I trained as a wrestler, as an entertainment wrestler for a while. No, they won't. Yes, we've definitely talked about this. I don't think we have. It's another one of those, oh, well, you know I... Uh... <laughs> No, we've done this. Because when I was in Germany, it took me a while to find like a gym, a stable of um of wrestlers. No. Okay. This is your other podcast, the John Witten one. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just just me nattering to my mum every week. So so it, it's a great promotion. It's called German Wrestling Federation. They have like a mini series on YouTube that they've done more than once, you know, <laughs> filling in all the backstories and the drama of the of the live promotions, the live fights. <laughs> That they do. Okay. This started off as very much like hardcore urban drama. And then in later seasons, they introduced real kind of supernatural elements. And there were vampires and werewolves. Very cool stuff. I trained with them. Oh, right. I have to be clear, I never got up in the ring for them. Oh, right. And this was a couple of things. I had quite, you know, a knee injury. Mm. But the biggest thing was I had decided on my character. <laughs> <laughs> and so had they. Oh. They said, okay, what you've got, what you've, you know, your body, your face, your style... Barroom brawler. Oh. White vest. Mean sort of... Ketchup stain. Ketchup and mustard stains. Yeah, I, th I think so. Like, yeah. Just on the edge, uncouth, unshaved lad on the town. Mm. And I said, I hear that. Can I slightly tweak that? Mm, mm. I want my character name to be Empress. I want a peacock feather headdress and nine inch heels as I walk in. <laughs> and we <laughs> couldn't quite find the middle ground. I mean, there seems like so much common ground to build on there. <laughs> I've got to use my thigh high leather heels for something. And wrestling seems like the obvious answer to me. <laughs> but they were not having that. So I, I am waiting. I've done a couple of kind of small shows since then, but not with them. So maybe one day I'll get the call from them that they are... They're ready. They are reconsidering. You're just too forward-looking for them. Yes, it's true. Mm. I was sure we talked about that. <laughs> but yes. I mean, I'm quite glad we haven't. I'm happy to just eat these things out over time. Oh my gosh. It's a shame to get rid of them all in one go. <laughs> Do you know the word eek? Obviously, the, 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 obviously nothing. I learned from a random tape I listened to when I was eight. Yes. In Chaucerian English... Meaning also. Okay. That's where we get to eke out, kind of add to. Oh, really? So this is the origin, which is so cool to me, of nickname. All right. <laughs> it used to be called an 
eek name. Okay. And also name. Then the N got transferred over and it became a neek name, which became a nickname. And also name, an AKA. How cool and relevant to our central goal as a podcast is that story. Wow. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, <laughs> all of which is to say, even with my intensive martial art and falling over convincingly training, yes. I'm not sure I could take on John Witten the cage fighter. Mm. And as such, do not consider myself the patriarch or even sort of no. under warrant officer. The matriarch? <laughs> I, look, I, I would accept any arc, <laughs> archbishop, for example, archdeacon. But no, I am very much a proud card-carrying member, rank and file. There's also an aeronautic engineer in, in Alabama. <laughs> I've, I've followed a couple of John Whittons. What do you know about the Mike Seniors of this world? I know there's a Mike Senior who vies with me for Google CEO, uh, SEO. Rather. <laughs> Google CEO? Are you both going for that position? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's an actor who's done some stuff in uh, The Walking Dead. Oh, seriously? He's been in a few episodes of that. Not, not many. I've got to say, on Google, you're doing pretty well for... Um, Careful. For the CEO position. <laughs> <laughs> no, all I've got coming up is your books, your videos, your websites. The summary is you. I've gone all the way through the first page, and it's just you. Oh, blimey. That's not bad at all, is it? And then halfway down the second page, Mike Senior, IMDB. That's the one. And I'm assuming that one's not yours. <laughs> That's him. I mean, I'd feel a bit gutted if I were him, actually. I have to say. R- yeah. To have a, a slightly random obscure music technologist be stealing all your thunder online <laughs> just because he's got links to a million SOS articles. <laughs> hey, it works. By contrast, there's a lot of musicians called John Witten, which is a bit annoying. Oh, right. I've got something of a Rebecca Angel problem myself. Well, in which case you need some advice. Of course. Thank heavens we have an Agony Aunt coming on a, an episode <laughs> near you. I always look forward to Mike's news. I do. But there are ones I specifically look forward to. And that's when we both say, okay, ready to go? Ready to go. Lovely. Recording? Yep, I'm recording. And then he kind of smiles. (laughs) Takes a deep (laughs) breath in, deep breath out. Puts his hand on his chin as he wonders, where do I begin? Is it like a banquet laid out before him? (laughs) So I'm particularly excited for this month's news. Mike, what do you got for us? I come bearing news from a trusted source. It is this year's Ig Nobel Awards. I mean, I do like the Ig Nobel Awards. And this year, as usual, there was much to enjoy. Mm -hmm. The award I'd like to focus on in news this month... What have we got? ...is the award that was given to Susanne Schutz at the University of London, Sweden. Right. She had the Biology Award. Okay. Congratulations, Susanna. For her 10 years of pioneering research. Okay. Okay. So this is not just someone's paper... We are putting up for ridicule. Oh, no. This is a career at this point. This is a good 10 years work. Magnificent. Researching domestic cat vocalisations. Oh, okay. I'm with you. I'm staying with you. I, <laughs> by sheer force of will. Well, it all started back in 2011. <laughs> right. With a conference paper called Comparative Acoustic Analysis of Purring in Four Cats. <laughs> Now, there aren't many research projects I would rather be doing data collection work for than in recording cats purring. I'm normally not a fan of the phrase, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But Susanna seems to have found a way. (laughs) It's like, I don't know, quality of assessment of four different types of chocolate. I I know. know. It's like a longitudinal study over six years. Oh, well, you want to do it thoroughly. Is this chocolate as good as it was yesterday? Mm. This is the kind of rigour we have to exercise. Exercise when <laughs> we want to be taken seriously in the scientific community. Now, the thing is that, as with all the Ig Nobel stuff, mm. it's kind of funny on the face of it, and yet there's other stuff involved. There's stuff going on. And I hadn't realised this, but actually, surprisingly little is known about purring. Okay. They still don't properly know the mechanics of how they do it. Okay, okay, that's interesting to me. Because there are some weird kind of exceptions to it. Like, most felines do it, mm. but any of the big cats, the ones that roar... Like lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, Hmm. they don't. And they can't. They never purr. No. Okay. But cheetahs can purr. Right. Do you want to hear a cheetah purring? Yeah. I think I'd like that very much. (laughs) Okay, here goes. (laughs) 
What a glorious noise. A real find. It's just excellent. It is on the website, <laughs> brilliantly, purring.org. <laughs> Why? <laughs> the website of one of her collaborators, Robert Eklund. <laughs> Why must you give me URLs while we're recording? <laughs> purring.org. What a lovely website. But there's an important question that you may not have asked yourself. I can believe that. Right. A cheetah is about 25 times <gasps> the size of a domestic cat. Right. And it's per- Purring frequency is only about five hertz lower. Oh, that's so interesting. I, I didn't pick up on that at all, but you're right. The sound maker must be proportionally pretty similarly sized to that in a house cat. Somehow. Or there's something compensating. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> like, how did you do this? It sounded like nothing at all, but all of a sudden... You know what this immediately makes me think? Tell me. I think it might help elucidate this problem. <laughs> right. If we got a cheetah and we got a domestic cat... And we gave them Heliox. <laughs> Where is our grant award? This is... Oh, of course. It's... I think we have some people we need to put in touch with each other. And then, and then once you can stop laughing, do some analysis. Cross-disciplinary. <laughs> oh, isn't it lovely? Absolutely. Oh, it's a great noise, though. It just brings to mind a question, actually. I've just got this vivid image in my head of someone going up to a cheetah and tickling it under the chin. <laughs> How did they get this? How did, did, oh, they must go into that in the paper. Do they not? Uh, well, there's a picture on purring.org of them crouching over a cheetah that's lying on the floor. Anyway, <laughs> but that's besides the point. <laughs> That was where it all started back in 2011. Over the next four years, she did four more papers Mm -hmm. doing a linguistic-style analysis on cat vocalisations, which are surprisingly varied. Mm. And they give them all sorts of weird names like chirp, murmur, tweedle, (gasps) moan, trill. Okay. These are all names for cat vocalisations. So you do recognise the sounds when you hear them, you just hadn't organised them in your head as these subtypes. No, exactly. You hadn't thought. You just thought, oh, cat, meow. (laughs) But no, there's this whole range of vocalisations. Okay. And they're speculating in those papers that this range of vocalisations, and also the variation in pitch that they applied to these vocalisations, might carry linguistic signals. That actually there might be a lot more communication in cat vocalisations than they thought. I mean, I'm I'm interested. How is this possible? And also that they might be using their vocalisations to mimic their prey (gasps) to lure them in. See, that's the level of fiendishness I would expect from a cat. (laughs) That's the level of Machiavellian. I'm trying to think of how to phrase this without getting Errol involved. (laughs) But hey, that sounds very cattish. Yeah. Let's just put it there. Mm. Oh, gosh. But even more interestingly, Mm. they turned the tables and they decided to study human response to cat vocalisations. Okay. The thing is, you see, right, you know that pretty much every dog and cat owner thinks they understand what their cat wants okay from the noises they make they go oh that sounds like he's hungry or that sounds like he wants to be let out all the kind of stuff right absolutely yes and so they said well is that something that the cat has learned Mm. that's unique to the relationship between them and that person or do cats actually instinctively have a communication method that is common to all of them and that we'd all understand oh interesting is there actually a form of universal cat human communication going on this is a deep well and so they tested it and and what did they find so what they did was they got 12 different meows okay six of which were meows in response to the promise of food you know they they were just about to be fed and they were meowing to get food Mm -hmm. and the other six were when they were in the vet or in their box in the car waiting to go to the vet (laughs) okay so two more distinct meow styles could surely not be found (laughs) but they were both meows and a meow has a definite definition it has to have at least one form and there has to be some diphthong element. So this is all very carefully categorised. Oh, amazing. And they then got 30 people to try and categorise which ones were which. And they found, with statistical significance, Hmm. that humans could tell the difference across (gasps) multiple cats. Okay, so even if it wasn't their cat... That we were 65% likely to get the right answer. Okay. And that people who were familiar with cats were better at it. (laughs) Okay, implying that, as you say, that there is a commonality to this cat language absolutely wow i why was this only 30 people i'm so curious for this data now well um, good question because all of these studies were pilot studies Mm. the sample size the number of cats the number of people was extremely small right but in 2016 Mm -hmm. they received a five-year research grant (gasps) to launch further proper detailed investigations and no word of a lie it's called the 
Music project. <laughs> well, now I'm upset. <laughs> Studying melody and cat human communication. Mike, I was so on their side. <laughs> I really was. Honestly, I swear to goodness, the next words out of my mouth, if this hadn't been where you were going with this, was going to be, hey, can we start a fundraiser? <laughs> Can't cost that much to get a person to listen to some meows. <laughs> Maybe we can get them up to 100 people. Guys, I was on your side, but then that title. Why would you do that? Okay, the Meowsic project. Fine, it's happened. And their first large scale study of 70 cats hmm. has shown that and this is reading from the conclusions of their study hmm. meows in positive and requesting contexts and mental states are often characterized by a short duration and by a high and rising melody hmm. meows in negative contexts and mental states are often characterized by a long duration <laughs> and by a low and falling melody is it just me or can you actually imagine those meows <laughs> i feel like i can imagine those meows i feel like i know even though i've never owned a cat i know exactly what they're talking about yeah 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 you're waiting for it aren't you <laughs> you're waiting for me to go <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to <laughs> that is excellent Mike. that was excellently performed entirely worth the wait yeah just call me the cat whisperer <laughs> <laughs> they also have other research aims and I'm so excited about this <gasps> yes please yes please <laughs> for example they've been wondering hmm. just like you said when people speak to cats they often speak to them in like baby talk yeah and so one of the things they were considering researching was whether cats understood baby talk Ooh. better than adult talk <laughs> Gosh, that would be so validating for a lot of the worst people in the world. I, I, you know, I, I think we should be generally searching towards truth, but I just don't know if that would be a useful truth for humanity to know that people who speak to cats like babies are actually in the right. If I were a member of that funding research board, hmm. I would fund the thing practically blind on one condition. Oh, yeah? That I was allowed to hear all the test signals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems like a fair request. I think I'd be on board with that if I, if I were up there with you, I'd say. I think the amusement value would have to be exceptional. They just have to burn them onto a CD and we can pass it around the board <laughs> or put it on the speakers during the Pizza Friday. And maybe they could even just do that as a proposal condition. <laughs> <laughs> just toy with them like a cat. Yeah, well, precisely. <laughs> kind of fitting. Because you're sooner or later, there's going to be someone in a vocal recording booth. Mm. You know, perhaps a voice actor who didn't read the brief too carefully, just like came into work. <laughs> and then has to say, sorry, have I got the right script here? <laughs> no, 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 it's like everything, everything's fine. It says, come here, Fluffikins, come to Mumsy, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Who's a pretty witty girl you are, you know you are. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> sorry, can I get some kind of direction here? This is... Oh. oh, to be a fly on the wall. And the second research topic that caught my attention was... Yes, please. They were thinking of trying to research whether there were cat dialects. Oh. Because there has been research evidence that some whales hmm. in different parts of the world have different dialects to their whale song. Okay. You know, basically different accents. It's like a Geordie whale as opposed to a, a Cockney whale. <laughs> and on the face of it, again, this seems like one of these ridiculous things, but... The reason why you get dialects hmm. is because there's language learning from the parent to the child. Right, that makes sense. So if they showed that there were cat dialects, it would imply that cats were passing their dialect on to their kittens. Via generations, okay. And implies a kind of language learning communication thing. And that would imply that if a kitten was adopted very early, mm. if they learned anything... They would learn it from humans. Oh, wow. Blimey. That's a bold assertion, yes. If they are susceptible to learn language, to imitate sound in some way or another, mm. we might be teaching kittens. First, so first the cat teaches us how to speak cat, <laughs> and then we teach the kittens yes. how to speak human-cat hybrid. It could have a human accent, basically. <gasps> Why do I want to get involved in this research now? Yeah, exactly. And particularly because we suspect that they have the skills to mimic their prey. Right, yeah. They might well pick up a human accent. Wow, that would be freaky. Well, they say that people start to look like their dogs. But imagine <laughs> if you like decide to sound like your dog. Yes. Yeah, I mean, of course, this is the other thing. We know that humans learn to mimic sounds. So while we may be teaching the cats our accent, the cats might be teaching us. Wow. There, this is very disturbing, Mike. Wow. Or should I say meow? <laughs> oh, no, wow was fine. Wow was, wow was acceptable. <laughs> Rec 
recurring features of some of our face palms in the past mm. has been the sense that having had the face palm, we've learnt an important lesson that has set us up for the future. Yes. <laughs> And yet somehow there are certain face palms that resist <laughs> such a tidy and wholesome <laughs> assessment. Certainly. And that no matter how many times we do them, they still keep popping up and slapping us in the face again. <laughs> and this month's face palm is one that I was just reminded about just in the run of things because it's always happening to me. Mm-hmm. But I was doing um, a review of the Cortado Mark III microphones. Okay. And as part of this, I've been doing audio examples. And the thing with these microphones, because they're contact microphones, they pick up significantly more or less signal level, depending on exactly where you put them on the instrument. Okay, yeah. And because I was recording my piano up in the living room, I couldn't really adjust the levels before I went up and recorded it, because I was trailing cables up the stairs. So I was doing a bit of back and forth, and sometimes the levels weren't right. Mm. And so I'd do a test recording when I'd move the contact mice to a different position, when they were much quieter, and then I'd get downstairs and want to listen to the results of it and think, oh, crumbs, I needed more level on that. So I'd just turn it up on my monitors mm-hmm. so I could hear what that position sounded like. Yeah. And then just forget that I'd left the DAW playing and been merrily typing myself notes, at which point... My DAW would reach the end of the recorded timeline that I'd just done, loop back to the beginning to something much louder, (gasps) and suddenly blast it out of the speakers at me. Oh, my word. (laughs) That sounds immensely painful in in every way. But it is a facepalm that repeatedly happens to me in different configurations. (laughs) Basically, the common theme is unexpectedly blasting myself or other people (laughs) with alarmingly loud sounds. Oh, let's have a look through the rakes gallery. (laughs) I want to... Yeah, hear about your your history, your background with this particular face palmic tradition. This frequently happens to me when I'm editing podcasts. Oh yeah, how so? And particularly with this one because it, the levels in the final mix are quite loud. Mm. And after I've edited the whole thing together, mm. I'll find myself a little section of background noise mm. and set up noise reduction processing to reduce the background noise. Okay. And while I'm doing that to assess the noise reduction, I'll often turn my monitors up. <laughs> And you know what happens next? Yeah. It happens every time. It's like Charlie Brown. (laughs) Charlie Brown, Lucy and the football. Yep. Yep. I know the image. I mean, it's particularly (laughs) bad if I'm doing some kind of a training thing. And I'm just talking to someone through doing something and I go, oh, well, you know, you've got to be careful switching fans and power on that you mute the monitors and then I forget to do it. <laughs> or I unplug something or <laughs> switch something or whatever. And it's only after it's gone <laughs> through the monitors that I go, oh, shit, I should have I, I don't know any medium, any creative endeavour where th- those small mistakes are so rudely pointed out. You know? <laughs> At volume. Exactly. Where you are literally slapped round the ears. <laughs> If you plug or unplug something at the wrong time, turn fans and power on or off when you shouldn't have. Oh, I've got another one. Oh, yeah. And I challenge you to say this has not happened to you. Maybe it hasn't. In which case, live a free and joyous life. But <laughs> you're troubleshooting some microphone or something mm-hmm. and you're looking around and, you, and you, you just don't seem to be getting any level. So you turn the preamp level up yes. and then don't turn it down when you're still checking other stuff and eventually find the thing, root it through and suddenly you get power cord going through you. Like, <laughs> blisteringly <laughs> clipping volumes. No, one. 100%. And, the, you know, I can take it as a price of doing business when I'm doing my own things. But when I've got other people on headphones... Oh, God, yeah. Headphones, I have handed them headphones that they have put on in an act of trust to me. <laughs> and just something screams through. <laughs> or you just... I don't know, the talk back's 100% too loud. Or you just do something that sends loud sound their direction unexpectedly. I am amazed, actually, that there is not as standard a limiter on fallback systems. There is. Then then how is it that we can send through like a scream, which is presumably louder than anything you'd want to put on there? I think the clue is in the podcast title. <laughs> right. We're not called <laughs> Studio <laughs> Tea Break. So maybe this happens slightly less often at Abbey Road. No one with any reasonable budget working in the project studio is ever going to be able to afford that kind of stuff. So you're right. It feels like a price of doing business. Yeah. And yet it never feels like it gets any easier. No. And I think I think the other thing is that so much of any dimension of audio work involves sort of carefree fiddling. Yeah. You know, you want to fix the EQ on something, and maybe this is different for you. For me, that there are kind of first principles which are good to know, but ultimately you're f***ing around. Yeah. Sorry, Errol, you're messing about. <laughs> and then you're dealing with, you know, a jack lead and a live speaker. Yeah. And you just carry that attitude of like, well, I'll try it in here, and I'll try it in there, and I'll try it in... Yeah. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, you've deafened the control room and three promising young musicians. 
Creativity meets the laws of physics. With a bump. Now, there's actually something that happened to me just the other day, and I wonder whether this is actually karmic retribution for all the times I've done this. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, are you getting your just desserts? Right, now... Ever since I've moved to Germany, there have been those occasions where I've sent my wife a WhatsApp titled, you know you live in Germany when number 354, (laughs) right? Yes. And I sent one to her when I found sauerkraut juice on the shelf. (laughs) Or when I think I saw something like the McDonald's McDumpling or something. I don't know what it was. (laughs) McBratwurst. (laughs) <laughs> but the most recent thing that caused me to do this is that mm. you ever been to one of those like maypole festivals that they sometimes have in different little villages and, and areas around? I would have thought around the blacksmith in your area they would have had that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I, I am aware of the things of which you speak. And in our neck of the woods, there's like a hunter's group. Okay, yeah. And they, on those days, high days and holidays, they come out in their finery oh. with these antique like blunderbuss style pistols. Oh. And about a dozen of them will line up in kind of militaristic fashion and let these things off all at once. And it sounds like a cannon going off. It's the loudest thing you've ever heard. It's crazy. (laughs) I've been there on a couple of times when this has happened and Mm. have usually ended up like running away and holding my ears. Mm. But I was off to do the shopping. So I was driving the car round by the bakery and up past the crossroads and literally was right next to these guys without realising it when they let this thing off and I was in the car. Oh, I can't imagine. (laughs) Honestly, my first thought was, actually, it reminds me of that piglet thing in uh, Winnie the Pooh. Which one? Where he's carrying the balloon and then he trips over and there's a huge bang and the writing is something like, first piglet thought that the world had exploded. Then he thought only he'd exploded. (laughs) And only then did he realise that the balloon that he'd been carrying had popped. But it felt like that. It was like, this is a huge noise. First thing I thought was, actually a bomb has gone off. Right. I mean, this is a terrorist situation yeah. secondly I thought has some large bit of masonry landed on the car <laughs> I'm amazed I didn't like swerve the car and hit someone well really that seems like a very real danger there was no one out stopping the traffic there were no signs it was like well of course you should expect <laughs> the 12 gun salute to go off <laughs> in your right ear while you're driving past thank god I didn't have the window open oh, but this I thought well maybe this is karmic retribution for all those times I have forgotten to mute the monitors before switching phantom power off <laughs> It sounds like that healthy <laughs> ka-chunking sound. While, while being deeply sympathetic to the painful experience that my dear friend has suffered, <laughs> I cannot be the only one listening who is really keen for a recording of this sound. Oh. Who just would beg you to take a zoom out to the next holiday. But, you know, sounds like that. Gunshots never sound like what you think a gunshot sounds like. Yeah. It's almost just like someone clicking their fingers. It's not a very impressive noise. It's a crack sound rather than the boom that we get kind of in bonds. And I wonder whether if you recorded it, mm. it would just sound like someone tapping an SM58. Right, because that is, that's just what happens when the shockwave hits the mic. You wouldn't get the volume. You wouldn't get the kind of ambience. You wouldn't get any of that kind of stuff. You'd just get this rather uninspiring boop. But, but presumably you, you'd get the echoes. From, like, the buildings and around... Maybe, maybe. Nope, you can't get out of it that easily. I I want a Zoom recording. (laughs) Okay, I will try and nail it down. That was a worthy attempt there, Mike. (laughs) You you almost had me. No, don't mind me, he says, setting up a deck of tree. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, John, no, 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 I just don't think... Practically, from a music technology point of view... I don't want to chase around a bunch of hunters with a recorder, which is reasonable. Yes. I'm just saying I still want you to. You don't want to be pointing a rifle mic at 12 guys (laughs) with actual guns. No, this is fair. The Q section of our Q&A this month comes from the lovely Marcus in Bridgestock. Hi, Marcus. Hello, Marcus. Dear Breakers, what if you had a magic gopher? Oh, Wow. Oh, sorry, it does go on. More specifically, a magic gopher who could be taught to do one job in the studio. It would then perform that job flawlessly whenever you needed it done, leaving you free of that task forever. What job would you teach it? Oh, wow. This one, I wasn't sure this was going to be the question for us, but I have not been able to get it out of my head. Okay. It's just this idea of what's one thing you didn't want to do, not what equipment would you like or equipment you don't need. or Yeah. And I tell you what I've landed on after going around a few things. It's microphone setup. Okay. You know, a lot of my time is spent recording instruments, recording vocals live. Oh, yeah. And a lot of the rest of my time is spent typing emails and drinking coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing breaks the flow of transition from one to the other 
than wrestling in a relatively small space with a mic stand. Yes. It's awful. Thank God I came across these sort of desk-mounted microphone arms. Yeah, there's kind of angle poised stands. Yeah, which means that I don't have to always be pulling out this three-legged monstrosity. But even still, like getting it in the right position, moving the chair somewhere else, especially if it's a double bass or something. Yes. And the idea that a gopher could just whisk in and get the mic to where it needs to be. I could just pull down a guitar yeah. and Magic Gopher would not just put it somewhere, but also do the bit of thought of what's the sound we're after, where should the mic go right like, doesn't need to be perfect on perfect but just i don't want that experience i've had way too many times of rushing through that first bit recording a bunch and then having a listen back and realizing i've got some unusable boomy nonsense because i'm <laughs> too on access to the sound hole or something and it's like well this this was pointless i mean basically what you want is you want one of those mythical assistants against which every real assistant <laughs> has always been measured <laughs> Since the beginning of time. <laughs> Since the dawn of time. It's that assistant that somehow, silently and telepathically anticipates what you're going to want to do next. Yeah. You know, you've just finished writing something and you've been scrolling through patches and your eye has happened to glance at the acoustic guitar patch that's happened to come up in your virtual instrument. Mm. And just seeing you do it going through the patch list and the look on your face makes him think, you know what, I bet he's going to record acoustic guitar. <sighs> and so at the point you go, I know what, I need to record... And then they're there. Your acoustic guitar, sir. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like the butler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's what you need. It's like a studio butler. Yes, indeed. An acoustic guitar, but I'd quite like a sort of expansive sound. A spaced stereo pair in the grand hall, sir. <laughs> it is totally like that. <laughs> it's awaiting your pleasure, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but how can I really get in the mood without a mahogany stool and footstep to use, sir? The lighting is, I think, you will find to your satisfaction. <laughs> I've taken the liberty, sir, of lighting a, a few candles in the... <laughs> candelabra. In the candelabra. And lowering them to a, to a point where it is uh, clear but not intrusive. Enough dry ice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I wouldn't mind that either. But honestly, just someone who means that I don't have to try and keep a tune in my head while trying not to run over XLR cables in a wheelie chair. Well, I mean, in a sense... You're pining from a, for a bygone age mm. of being sat in a studio as the creative, having the technical stuff taken care of. I've occasionally got whiffs of that, tastes of that, mm. working on other people's projects primarily. But when, you know, you'd go in and set up, and tune up, and then you'd go off with the band leader or the composer or whatever yeah. to have a little chat, a little check-in, and you'd come back in. And the microphones would be there, and that's great, and that's good. Yeah. But it would be little things like... All of the mic cables would move in straight lines towards each other and then make like a beautiful eight lane highway back towards the <laughs> control room. Perfectly in line, taped down, mm. just beautiful. Your music would already be on a stand next to your instrument. Your headphones would have that slight whiff of disinfectant. They'd be <laughs> lemon fresh. And pre-warmed for your ear comforts. Yeah. I had one where I was playing a few different instruments and the tech had printed me out separate scores to have at my three different stations. Oh. And, <laughs> oh, if they provide folders for the music, like it's all stuff that's not necessary, but it does just kind of like, yes. <sighs> Yeah, that's just fine. Yeah. Of course, the flip side of that is at that point, any mistakes are entirely yours. I mean, that, that is the flip side. It gets a bit judgier, doesn't it? <laughs> when you can't blame it on the microphone, you know? <laughs> I was doing some dulcimer recording a few weeks ago and the producer sent me the score three weeks in advance. Right. And then, uh, and then a week and a half said, oh, there have been some minor changes. Here's the new score and here's the changes we've made. Right. And he was on time and fully set up. Like, I, he asked me about mics and I kind of gave him my two cents and... It is that raised pressure when you can't even be saying to yourself, well, look, they texted me the music this morning. Mm. And I, no, no, they have done everything right. Now it's my turn. Yeah, it kind of sets the bar, doesn't it? It, it does. They are doing it absolutely as they should do it. <laughs> yes. So... Am I the weakest link in the chain here? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. This is, this is a really strong chain. If anything snaps at this point, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be no question. So yeah, these magical butlers sound incredible. If, if my gopher could just like get a mic pointing in the right direction, that would be a studio job that I would be so happy to never have to touch again as long as I live. Yeah. How about you? Have you, have you got any that spring to mind? It's interesting because... 
moving mic around, of course, is the thing that I kind of do. So that's never occurred to me that I might want to get someone else to do it. <laughs> well, no, this is something that you are particularly good at. But it's almost like you're stuck in trade. It'd be a bit like saying, well, what I really want someone to do is play the guitar for me. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, why am I here exactly? <laughs> Write and record beautiful songs. Yes. <laughs> to which I can attribute my name. So for me, I think it's more about humdrum stuff, like the stuff that is totally unconnected to the stuff that makes me interested in doing what I do. Yeah. The first thing that sprang to mind was I could really handle someone who'd just empty my bin a bit more regularly. (laughs) (laughs) Never let it be said that Mike Senior lacks imagination and ambition. (laughs) I've offered you a magic gopher. I mean, I'm very careful with my live streaming setup Mm. that it points in a certain direction in my studio. (laughs) Because Mm -hmm. right behind it is where my bin is. Mm -hmm. And so many things work against my bin being an ordered picture of neatness. (laughs) Domestic bliss. One of them is the fact that I can't physically see it from where I'm sitting. Oh, no. Okay, so it doesn't impose on your view. Because it's tucked kind of behind and around the desk. And so it's only really the off chance that I manage to bounce it off the acoustic treatment that whatever I throw into the bin goes in the bin. (laughs) Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking, if you looked at my bin under the desk, that it was some kind of a plastic volcano. (laughs) Spewing detritus about the room. I'm a creature of habit. Mm. And so I'll have my, like, packet of little gummy mushroom things that I often get when I go shopping amazing and I'll finish the packet and I'll throw the packet over the side of the (laughs) desk towards the bin and maybe I would say between two and three sevenths of the packets that I throw over hit the bin and the fact that I can work in such large scale denomination fractions (laughs) gives you an idea of how long it is between when some granular knowledge there I empty the bin (laughs) and how littered the whole floor is around the bin I mean And it's particularly bad because, obviously, with lockdown, no one's been visiting. Mm -hmm. And usually that is the final spur to guilt trip me into actually emptying my bin. That's the impetus, isn't it? And the floor around it. No, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. (laughs) So, yeah, just having someone who regularly emptied my bin, that that magic plastic-eating gopher, the Hoover bin. (laughs) Yeah, I can see that being handy. I think think that's really quite a joyful answer, kind of implying that... (laughs) <laughs> the fact that you would like to continue doing kind of each of these steps of the process means either this, this, is a, this is a deeply felt vocation at every part or that you're just a raging control freak. Um, <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> what now? Oof. I mean, what Oof. do you reckon the odds on each of those? <laughs> I'm sure I don't know, Mike. I think that's, that's between you and God. Uh, <laughs> I know where the short odds are, I think, on that one. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, I, I wouldn't want to venture a guess. So, more broadly... Tuning my Yangjin, my, my dulcimer, takes about half an hour to 40 minutes every time. Ah. I, for a long time, thought that this would become a meditative experience, that this would be an opportunity for me to connect with my instrument. Mm. It's fine. It goes between really rubbish and fine, mm. the experience of having to take this time for a rehearsal. But <laughs> sell it to me. <laughs> if I. Ne- what a spectrum. Yeah, yeah, really. You this- know, you get up in the morning and you go, I'm about to have a 45 minute chunk of. Somewhere between really rubbish and fine. I mean, yeah. I can practically hear the skip in your step. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And it's normally what starts the day as well. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, if, if I never had to do that again, God, I'd give an awful lot. Mm. If I get to the point where, before I go on stage, someone I trust has tuned my dulcimer, I will lose any ambition I've ever had <laughs> to climb any higher than that. Like, I, I will consider myself sated and satisfied. That's all I need. Yeah. So that one is very, very high up my list. I think I'd quite like to have the gopher who would go behind things to plug stuff in or move stuff or get stuff out. <laughs> oh, you're right. That's definitely one. You know, the number of, like, <laughs> scrapes and bruises and stuff I've got just crawling around the backs of things. Or, you know, just having to squeeze yourself behind your, your desk to flick your monitor switches. Someone to do that thing that involves squeezing round stuff and under stuff and through stuff. Yeah. Or, you know, when you have to get your torch out and look behind a rack and stuff. Some shady cupboard somewhere. I could definitely get on board with that. I mean, there'd have to be some kind of danger money, though. Because the amount of times I've pranked myself in various entertaining ways, and difficult to explain ways. <laughs> you have a big scratch down your back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so how did you get that exactly? I was limboing <laughs> under a roof beam, <laughs> trying to find a it's broken from, Those parallel scratches on my back are from a heat sink. <laughs> 
that I had no business putting my back that close to. But here we are. You know, another one for me, and it's, and it's commonplace, but it, it's another thing about the annoyingness of live recording. Mm. Someone who was always there, ready to press record. Yeah. Stop record go back to the beginning of the track or, or go somewhere else in the track mm. or make a new track and record on that one. A tape op, basically. Yes, I just... <laughs> so basically what you're trying to tell me is that slowly you're populating a complete studio. <laughs> <laughs> and you want a studio manager who'll book the sessions. <laughs> you want the tech guy in the basement who's then going to sold the cables when they bust. <laughs> I mean, I, do, I don't hate the idea. You're reverse engineering Abbey Road is what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Now, after more than 40 episodes, it should be clear to regular listeners that Mm. we are now masters of the art of, I mean, not just food foley in a general sense, but (laughs) of the specific (laughs) niche cult of toast foley artists. (laughs) (laughs) And I believe, John, you have our most recent masterpiece. I'm like a diva refusing to come out on stage until I'm properly introduced. This is just me (laughs) standing in the wings, my lips pursed, and my hands on my hips being like, do better. You want me on that stage? Do better. (laughs) Okay, um, uh, we're on different mics, but this should come through. Okay, okay. It's fine. Let's have have a try. Now, the first time I met David, the first time Laura brought him round, I remember he he brought a lovely bottle of red wine, um, uh, insisted on doing the washing up, and then let me win at Scrabble. <laughs> and I remember saying to Laura later that evening, you, you know, you can keep him. And I am happy to say today that she's taken my advice. But in all sincerity, we are thrilled and honoured to be welcoming David to the family. So, ladies and gentlemen, to the groom and bride. Huzzah! That's, that's this month's Toast Foley. Well, there was a tear in my eye. <laughs> I don't want to tell you how pleased I was in the shower this morning when I thought of that. <laughs> I was ear to ear, Mike. I thought to myself, John, you've done it. In an otherwise toastless vista, suddenly. <laughs> I think what had kicked it off was that just before I jumped in the shower, I'd taken a look around the kitchen thinking... What am I going to use my toast foley? And the, you know, 43 episodes in, some 21, 22 of those that I've done toast foley for, mm. there's just nothing left. <laughs> the pickings are getting pretty slim, aren't they? This is why when I thought of this, I was like, well, there, there we go. There's one month in, there's one month more. <laughs> Too, because next month it's Mike's job. It is a life ring being clutched. Yes, it was. <laughs> so anyway, that is... <laughs> Toast, which again, I think's amazing. I am endlessly proud of. So what uh, what have you got for me to spread on top? Well, I am a big fan of hip-hop and hip-hop production in general. Mm-hmm. And I'm particularly chuffed at the moment that the UK hip-hop scene is really so busy at the moment. There's so much going on. Mm. Loads of new artists coming out. I mean, obviously Stormzy's a big deal. Mm. It's just really exciting stuff is being done by UK hip-hop artists. Oh, is there, is there a but? There is a but. And the but is that I'm getting really quite bored with the whole gangster posturing, grimier than thou thing. Right. That seems to characterise so much of what hip hop is about these days. <laughs> that being the only character out there. The problem is that the UK hip hop artists, so many of them just seem to be rehashing that US gangster attitude, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. with less sun, <laughs> less expensive sport cars, just less money. Right. It's like the kind of Morris Minor trying to be the <laughs> Corvette. That is- a very beautiful, very visual image. Yes, okay, I can, I can see that. And what is so depressing to me about this is that I come to it with an expectation that it is so possible to do absolutely inspired UK-based hip-hop yeah. that feels like as 100% British as chicken tikka masala. You know, it's, it's <laughs> that... <laughs> It doesn't really have anything to do with that US system. That It's something homegrown. Mm-hmm. And the reason I'm so confident that it is possible to do this is because of this month's jam. Oh, oh, what a, what a recommendation. What we got? A track that actually sounds as pioneering today, I think, as it did when it was released about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, my word. 2002, I think. It is by The Streets. That's one of my favourite artists ever. And it's a track called Don't Mug Yourself. Let's have a quick listen. Yes, please. Oh my god. It's what you say, like, it's brilliant and it's so English. Yes. It's so unmistakably English. There is nothing international 
or like universal about it, which is great. It's super specific. I, it's I, rooted in its own culture. Yeah, I can see the greasy spoon that they are in. I know exactly the one. Yes, I could find it on Google Maps. I could drop me in like anywhere in East London, and I will walk you to that greasy spoon. Yeah, and I will show you those guys having that chat. It's deliciously rooted. And there's no one like showing off. It's just them having conversations about honest to goodness real world things. Where hmm. you know he's met some girl at a club. And he's thinking about asking her out, and then he's arguing with his friend about whether he should go back to her or not. And it's all so mundane. Mm -hmm. The fact that he talks about getting an English breakfast given to him, or he's playing with the salt, or he's just... Playing with the salt is the is a great line. There's so many, many great lines. I mean, there's, again, this, there's this wonderful balance that he gets mm. of being super clever in the way that he's juggling the rhyme scheme in, t in terms of the way the rhythm is insane of how he's drifting in and out of the beat. It's, it's so interesting. I mean, the thing that just blows my socks off is that after the first chorus, the first hook section, yeah. it goes completely freeform and he and his mate are having this argument of speaking totally in like fragments of sentences. He goes, no, 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 honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm f***ing all right. I'm, you know, what, you know you're, yes. he's not completing any sentences or anything like that and you think it's gone completely freeform mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden he goes and then Cal says, oi, and he's right back into the rhythm and it's almost like whiplash effect you suddenly pull back into the rhythm and it's straight back into the beat he's a master of rhythm in that way the lyricising the poeticising of the mundane if you'll excuse me pulling every conversation back to Andy Schauf it reminds me of uh, I looked in the fridge it was a dark scene so I buttered some bread chewed my way out the door and walked down the street yes which is just so perfectly evocative I remember that line that's what playing with the salt reminded me of there and you know what else makes it kind of uniquely British for me? Not only is it not, you know, I'm, I'm rich and successful and... Yeah. I think it is subtly self-deprecating <laughs> as well. The singer puts himself in this position where he is a little bit head over heels yeah. with a girl. His friends are giving him what I think he probably thinks is good advice and he's getting all defensive <laughs> and talking about how in control of his feelings he is when he's not. And that's funny. That's great. And it's like, it doesn't have to be slammed in your face. Yes. That little bit of like friction yes. of the protagonist the rapper being a little bit of an idiot it's just Great. <laughs> I love the way in which he manages to make the language seem so natural, and yet it's rhyming, and yet it's in rhythm, and yet it's doing really clever and quite dramatic things. Like, mm -hmm. to use the phrase, like I'm some kind of sap jumping when she claps and that. But then it makes it sound so natural. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the way you get all these bits like the word oi is used the whole time. Or the one I love and just destroys me every time is when he goes... She'll want you much more for not hanging on. Stop me if I'm wrong. Stop me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Just destroys me because it's exactly the kind of thing you say in conversation and that you wouldn't normally think of writing into a song. Is what you would hear. And he just has so much of that kind of stuff. <laughs> then Cal grabs the phone like, oi, 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 oi. <laughs> Oh, it's such a fun cadence. It's a fun story. It actually does tell a story. Like, you get to know about what happened the night before. Yes. About what's going to happen next and what's going <laughs> to... It's got a setting. It's got a time scale. It's got, like, a dramatic conflict over the phone. Yes. It's all there. I've yet to find another hip-hop artist who feels like he's properly taken on the mantle, or she, has properly taken on the mantle of the streets. Right. There's a rapper called R.D., who did a track called Oliver Twist. I don't know. And that began to move a little bit that way. He had that same kind of conversational thing and the kind of range of pitches and deliveries and stuff that I really liked about the streets. But what fell short for you in the long run? It was still a little bit braggy. There's something about this. It's more than perfectly the opposite. Yeah. Because the main character or whatever yep. is kind of bragging. He's telling you how in control he is. He's telling you how smooth he is and stuff. Yes. <laughs> You just don't believe him. Well, the writer undercuts him at every single turn. You know, from the fact that this guy claiming to be like a Lothario is having breakfast with his mates in a greasy spoon. <laughs> He's not waking up at, at this girl's place. She's not waking up with him. Like, <laughs> it's an argument about nothing in a greasy spoon. Yeah. And I wonder if this is the kind of great art that will not last that long because it is so specific. Mm. And I wonder if the culture of like going out and getting drunk with your mates and then having a full English afterwards drops a bit, then immediately the song's maybe not got the same job it can do. It's mm. maybe it would work. Work and maybe work in different ways but if i'd grown up in tokyo i don't think i could hear the same song maybe yes because it makes such specific cultural references yes when he says he's playing with the salt i can see the salt shaker yes like i literally know which one he's talking about it's one of those ribbed ones that are like hexagonal yes. and the tops of green plastic <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>
Parting is such sweet sorrow. Endings are hard. And one of these days, we're going to just try and do a fade out ending because that's what a lot of people do when they don't know how to finish something. We're just going to keep talking and gradually turn on the volume. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to call that production. Yeah. And then when we have to do it live, we're going to put something really cheesy and clunky and poorly planned at the end mm. because fade outs don't work out live. And, and I think it should be a big song and dance number for Project Studio Tea Break the Musical. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be our, our first act closer. And then I think we do the Sondheim thing and we finish the show on a strangely kind of introspective quiet piece. Oh, I see. On a single spotlight kind of thing. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. Sending the clowns or, or being alive or the something. The Hamilton Gasp. Hey, your daughters have been bullying you into finding out more about Hamilton. <laughs> Check out those musical theatre chops. <laughs> Before we um, entirely give up control of who lives, who dies, and who tells our story, um, we have time to thank our wonderful sponsors for, for this month's episode. Of course. Now, for so long, frustrated hardcore punk and rock fans have been fruitlessly headbanging on the air, and there is surely mm. no more tragic sight than watching these would-be cranial percussionists mm. just use this energy and talent and get nothing back. Yeah. So we have created chest-mounted head drums. <laughs> Anything from small congas uh, to a whole floor tom that you just strap to your chest, just kind of below your neck, and can headbang into. I mean, there is a danger that the mosh pit might overwhelm the band. <laughs> <laughs> Well, kind of the, the, the glory is that once the band has played half a song, the thing just sort of sustains itself. Yeah, it's like a human looper pedal. <laughs> it is set to slightly too high feedback. Um, <laughs> it, it can be a bit dangerous, but people participate in these things at their own risks. Well, I mean, I'm delighted that they sponsored the show. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, while their business is still strong enough to do so. Do you think they might be willing to branch out into some kind of a hand-based head percussion? A bit like this. Because I think we could get behind that. I think I think that's going to be our first collaborative project, a sort of palm on face sort of creation. I think that's face castanets. <laughs> yes, I'll sponsor that. I'll put I'll put my face on it. Yes, yes. Um, is is more or less the plan. Mike, do we have an email? As it happens, we do. I'm so glad. It's imaginatively enough. <laughs> tea break at projectstudioteabreak.com, where you can send us questions, all sorts of abuse, <laughs> or, I mean, you know, support for the stuff we're doing. This is true. I need to say that say, I want to support with my words, but not only do I want to support with my words, I also wouldn't mind, like, kicking you a couple of quid, but... Only on the condition I get tons of bonus content in return. If they're feeling that kind of generous but also mercantile. Well, I mean, luckily enough, we do actually have a Patreon campaign. Oh, thank God. Where there are now more than 200 audio extras available. Fuck. Eight, in fact, just in the last month. Including, in case you were wondering. Oh, yes. More wishful spending suggestions than we did in the podcast the other day. <laughs> Some stuff that even educated fleas love. <laughs> and a glimpse into our very own John Witten's rock and roll lifestyle. So, philanthropic mercenaries rejoice. Mm. Um, you can be generous and be handsomely rewarded for it. Uh, and where can people find that? They can find that at patreon.com slash Project Studio Tea Break. If you're one of our youth listeners and are more into getting on the socials, then you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash PSTB books. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash PSTB tweets. And was there anything you wanted to plug this month, John? In terms of plugs, uh, you can come and see me and other people and me uh, at the Royal Opera House all this month and all of December. Tickets are going quite fast, so do jump in. Yes, you got to hurry. I, I was looking at tickets earlier and there were like sold out dates and stuff. Yeah, like uh, most of the December days. Are... Obviously, it's the publicity we've already been doing in last episode. I think they owe us commission. I reckon so, yeah. I'm going to be having some stern words. The show is called Wolf Witch Giant Fairy. That's your luchador name, wasn't it? <laughs> Wolf Witch Giant. I just couldn't pick. <laughs> I, I had four good ideas and I was like, you know what's better than one name? It's definitely four names. Yeah. Um, also, on the 12th of November, I'm going to be releasing the first track of a project that's been ruminating around for years and years now. So that's very exciting. Oh, wow. It's actually the first thing I've ever put out under my own name. Oh, wow. Fabulous. Which is kind of neat and exciting. So to find out more about that, you can follow the project's account. That's Witten, W-H-I-T-T-E-N, and A-N-D, underscore, on Instagram and TikTok. That's where I'll be posting that when it comes up. 
and would love my breakers to hear it. Exciting. Um, Mike, anything you're plugging? Well, I've got a couple of vocal editing articles that I've been doing for SOS. So there's going to be, I think one's already been printed and there are going to be another couple coming out in the coming months. And are those on the website? Uh, those should be available in all good news agents in Sound on Sound, but also on their website. At the moment, I think they're still doing a free digital edition of the magazine that you can go look at on their website. Amazing. During the corona period, they did that and I think that's still going. If you don't want to support the hard-working journalists, yes. you know, keeping the music industry alive, yeah, well, absolutely. Which is which is obviously your prerogative. And I've also just uh, reviewed the uh, Zeppelin Design Labs Cortado Mic 3, or I'm in the process of reviewing it. <gasps> and that will be coming out in my uh, Cambridge MT podcast. Which we're, of course, huge fans of. Probably by the time you hear this, it will be out. No spoilers. Do we still love them? Oh, yeah, Good. definitely. Because I've definitely got, got a thing for them. It's just a bit more qualified now, you see. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Rather than just, oh, wow, you can connect them to anything. It's got a little bit more sophisticated than that now. <laughs> Oh, goodness me. Well, I, I look forward very much to checking that out. Beautiful. And with that, we hope you have a, a lovely day. And um, ta-ra, pets. Ta-ra! Ta-ra!